Welcome to the first week of our study that's called Disciple. And the title for today is No Christians Allowed. Alright, so let me ask you a question by, you know, by way of explanation. When you hear the word dog, what do you think of? When you, when you hear the word dog, you think of something cute, uh, something funny, something a little bit more ferocious or fierce. When you think of the word cat, do you see it as evil or cute and cuddly, hanging from a branch saying, hang in there, baby, or the classic wet cat? Here's another one for you. What do you think of when you hear the word Christian? What comes to mind? Do you see a politician? Do you think of a pastor? Do you think of a political activist? Maybe you think of Mother Teresa. Do you think of someone who's kind and gentle, helping the poor? Or do you see a televangelist? When you hear the word Christian, do you think of a hypocrite? Or do you think of someone who is loving, generous, wonderful to be around? What do you think of when you hear the word Christian? Now, I think the response to that is going to be different for every single person. How do you feel about the term Christian? Right, for me, I think it's very vague. Um, it's a word that I, when, when I hear the word, I need to have it defined by who's saying it and why they're saying it and what they mean by it. It does not have one standard definition. There's not one standard feeling about it. And over the, the years, there's been a myriad of different kinds of feelings about it. You take the, my child, the 1950s. Um, that's when people had those, come on, that was 1950s people. They had a, a generally positive view. Then you get to the 2000s, 2020, whatever we are. And the, the thoughts range from super negative to super positive, And a whole bunch of people in the middle say, I don't know. I do know that I like to pick and choose who I get lumped in with. But I also know that I don't have that choice and neither do you. But if we were to wind back that clock past my early years in the 1950s, go back a couple of thousand years, and you find the, the first time that the word Christian is used, it was used in a, in a derogatory sense. It was negative. It was a pejorative. The very first time it was used was in the first century in one of the ancient cities called Antioch. And it was used by a group of people who were making fun. They were pointing the finger and saying, Christians! And they called these people Christians, which means um, Christ ones, or little Christs. And they were making fun of those Christ followers. Instead of saying, hey, mini-me, they were saying, hey, mini-hymns. And they wanted to, uh, to point out the fact that these people were trying to be like Jesus. You're trying to be like Jesus. Christ. And so it started out, again, as a derogatory term. They weren't complimentary about it. And when many people think about Christians, they will think about a group of people and what they're against. You know those Christians? Man, they are against everything. If it's fun, they are against it. And Christians in the past, Christians in the present, they have made a name for themselves about what they're against. And we've been against dancing and drinking and gambling and playing pool and swearing and short skirts and makeup and motorcycles and witchcraft and tarot cards and playing cards, sex, drugs, rock and roll, baby. We've been against it all. We're too well known for being against certain things. We need to increase the awareness of what we're for. But one of the worst things that Christians have become known for is being against other Christians. And too often we like to name call or look disparagingly upon other people who claim the name of Jesus and they just do it in a different way than we do. Think about this. Jesus never invited anyone to be a Christian. Never ever came up. So I like the word disciple. 
uh, the, the term, the idea of a follower of Jesus. And so that's why I put disciple in my email signature as a reminder to me and as a reminder to whoever I'm writing to. And one of, one of the guys that was hanging out with the people who used to be really close to hanging out with Jesus was a guy, a doctor named Luke. And he interviewed tons of eyewitnesses, he did lots of research, and he compiled what he calls an orderly account. And he said that he did it specifically for a guy named Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. But I think it's for us as well, that we might be able to know the certainty, because Luke went and researched it. So we're going to jump into a story in Luke. I'll just jump right there. It says, great crowds were following Jesus. And he turned around and he said to them, if you want to be my follower, you must love me more than your own father and mother, wife, children, yes, more than your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And you cannot be my disciple if you do not carry your own cross and follow me. But don't begin until you count the cost. Think about that. Don't begin until you count the cost. Because if you are a disciple of Jesus, it will cost you something, and it will continue to cost you something. And I'm not here talking about the watered-down, self-defining, North American version of a Christian. I don't mean cultural Christianity. Where, Because honestly, they say in North America, it's like 85% of the population, some 255 million people who call themselves Christian. And yet we know that that same 85% who call themselves Christian don't manifest a lifestyle of Christian sacrifice and earnest pursuit of Jesus. It's more of a cultural nice guy system. Maybe that term has lost its original meaning of following, of pursuing Jesus, the more of all. So I'm calling you to more. If you want to be a disciple, it, you need to understand that it is going to cost you. And consider that cost. Don't do this naively. There, this isn't about a little bit of churchianity, as long as you're not too busy, if you've got time, if you can fit it in. It's a radical way of life. What's it going to cost you? So first, Scripture promises that you will be persecuted, okay? Happy birthday, everybody! There it is. There's the gift that you've been promised. So, if you are not feeling persecuted at some point, you need to start to ask yourself a question. Are you really following Him? What is it going to cost you? And I don't know. For some, for some of you, it might, it might cost your job. Because you are unwilling to do something that other people are willing to do to keep their job. It might cost you a promotion because you're some sort of fanatical, radical Jesus follower. It might cost you a relationship. Some family members, they just might not understand, right? They may not be in support of you, what you believe. It may cost you popularity because you're not going to do what everybody else is going to do. It may make you stand out because you are going to be different. You are not going to look like, act like, be like the rest of the world around you because you are not of this world. In some parts of the world today, and you'll know this, in some parts of the world today, if you claim the name of Jesus, it can cost you your life. Christians, I think the term is unclear. I prefer the term disciple, um, and it, that comes from a Greek word, and that Greek word is mathetes. I learn people, disciple, follow. So we're talking about being a disciple of Jesus. What does it mean? What does it mean for us to be disciples, followers, students, pupils? It means that he is the rabbi. He is the teacher. He is the Lord. He is the master. We follow. We pursue him. What he did we do. And in this series, that's what we're going to look at. Some very basic, very tangible, very life applicable, hands on things that a disciple of Jesus does. Today, just to start, we're going to take a quick overview of three things that Jesus did and that we will do as disciples of Jesus. So, what does a disciple of Jesus do? He touches. He, she touches lepers. 
What do I mean? In our culture, we don't like to touch or to be around the unlovely. We kind of think that it's an infectious, right? So don't touch the ugly one or you'll be getting ugly too. Here, after I mow the lawn on a hot day, I come into the house and no one wants a hug. I have so much love to give and instead I met with shrieks of horror. Apparently I'm sweaty or I'm stinky. That reminds Mark of a story about when he was with Jesus. It says a man with leprosy came to Jesus and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Clean? How does clean come into this? Well, according to Leviticus 13, whenever a leper would enter into a village or community, I bet a bunch of you know this, he or she would be required to yell about himself or herself, I'm clean! I'm clean! And it was a warning so that everybody could run. And if the wind was blowing their way, they would run even faster. People don't want to be exposed to anything that this leper had or was near because it was the most horrendously disgusting disease that you can imagine. It would make the hands and feet knobs or stubs. It would cause oozing sores from all over their bodies. It would start in the hands or in the eyes and spread quickly until their body just would not function as it was supposed to. That's what you saw on the outside. But what happens underneath the skin, that's really where the disease is. This is where the real damage would take place. The people who had leprosy would lose all their nerves, the, the sense of the nerves in their body, so they couldn't feel anything at all. And it wasn't uncommon for a leper to fall asleep in the leper colony, go to sleep at night, sleep beautifully through the night, unable to feel, and a rat would come in the night, gnaw off one of their fingers, and so they would wake up the next day, and there's a finger missing because they couldn't feel anything. Some people call them the living dead. And that title went on to become a really popular idea because the idea of leprosy went on to be a template that has been used countless times in creating the zombies in movies. But a disciple touches those who others don't want to touch. So let's see what Jesus did. Look what he did and then why he did it. Okay, this is the first part. Filled with compassion. And that part for me is the most exciting thing. Filled with compassion. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. Immediately the leprosy left him and he was cured. It's a big miracle, right? But that's a whole other message. Let's just deal with the compassion. Filled with Compassion. The Greek word for compassion is a rich, uh, power-packed word. Splangnizomi. Yeah, just flows right off the top, right? It sounds like some fancy Italian Greek Mediterranean entree. Can I have a little spike on top of But it means to have the bowels yearn. Deep and tender mercy to be moved into action. It's an achingly powerful word. You're moved to action. How many of you have uh, ever seen the movie Hotel Rwanda? Yeah, well, gut-wrenching story, true story, about the racial battle between the Tutsis and the Hutus. The Tutsis and the Hutus in Rwanda. It's about a manager of a hotel, and uh, he's a true hero in all the senses of the word. He's protecting a certain group of people at the risk of his own life and the, and the life of his family. And this guy was talking to an international reporter, and in the movie he basically says, when the rest of the world sees and hears what's going on here, what we're going through, they will help. They've got to help. And the reporter looked on and said, you don't understand. When the rest of the world hears your story, they will watch it on TV. And they will say to themselves, oh, how horrible. Oh, what a tragedy! And then they will flip the channel and they will go on to something more comfortable. This one scene is so true, so disturbing. We just want to distance ourselves from the world. 
a disciple splendid zoning hurts so deep that he or she cannot not help. Cannot not. You're so full of the same kind of love that Jesus had that you are moved into action. Who are the lepers in our world? Well, they're going to look different. Maybe it's the guy who's got AIDS. And other people look around and say, well, you know how we got that, don't you? And maybe it's someone who's in jail. They, people in jail, people don't want to go to jail. They don't want to go visit people in jail. And so you're sort of pushed aside. Maybe it's an older person who's lost connection with what the rest of their family was. And they're, they're kind of lonely now. They feel forgotten. It could be the, the, the snappy street guy or street girl. It could be the obnoxious, obnoxious person in your class or at work, the ones who just won't stop talking all the time and they drive everyone insane. A disciple of Jesus feels so deeply for the hurt, for the outcast, for the downtrodden, that he or she cannot not help. So a disciple touches lepers, but a disciple also befriends prostitutes, the sinners, the people that people are thinking, those are the really, really bad people. So here's another story. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Who was Jesus hanging out with? Not the religious folks. The sinners. Or whether it was the woman at the well, or maybe she'd been around the block you know, with a bunch of men, or Maybe it was the woman who was caught in adultery that all the religious people uh, kind of wanted to stone and kill her. Jesus stood up for her. Whether it was the tax collectors, like Matthew or Zacchaeus, everyone hated them. Jesus was there. Or maybe it was the, the, the prostitute who came and fell at the feet of Jesus in worship. Throughout these ancient historical documents that we have bound together to what we call the New Testament, you will find Jesus befriending the sinners, the so-called Christians who listen to our, our own little music, we learn our own little language, we often lose touch with the kind of person, you know that kind of person, you know the kind that smokes or drinks too much alcohol or watches R-rated movies and the tattoos in weird places and piercings in weird places and, well, you can't hang out with them. They are that kind of person. Don't let your kids hang out with them. Their kids read Harry Potter for big sake. <laughs> when did we forget that it was for that kind of a person Jesus came? The Pharisees, they were ticked off. Jesus was, was hanging out with that kind of person. So the next verse, verse 11, when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher sit with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answers, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Disciples befriend prostitutes. Here's a question for you, if you call yourself a Christian. What is the last time that you had a non-believer over in your home and someone to repair something that is broken does not count. When's the last time you sort of opened up and, and hung out together, had a meal together, had a coffee together, you started doing something with someone who was one of those kind of people, that kind of person. Last time I checked, so were we. That kind of a person that needs Jesus. A disciple cares so much that he touches lepers and he befriends prostitutes. And while doing those things, those Christ-like things, they offend Pharisees. The overly legalistic, religious -y, churchy type people who forgot the original reason, the message of why Jesus came. Another story. On a Sabbath, Jesus is teaching in one of the synagogues and, and a woman was there who had been crippled by a spear for 18 years. And then Jesus put her, his hands on her and immediately she straightened up and praised God. Question, is that good or bad? For 18 years, she has been miserably tormented. Jesus 
touches her, heals her, good or bad? The answer is, it depends on who you ask. If you are a disciple, you go over the top, that's good, praise God, high five, worship, awesome, you're changed, you've been saved, you're healed, yeah! But if you're a Pharisee, you're going to say that. Why? Because the Pharisee is more interested in the letter of the law than the spirit behind it. It's like, you! So, you're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. That's the law. So look at how the Pharisee responds. Right? Indignant. That's the first word. Indignant. Because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. The synagogue ruler said to the people, there are six days for work. So come here and be healed on one of those days and not on the Sabbath. There's another story. You can read this one on your own time. It just cracks me up. It's in Matthew chapter 12. So Matthew chapter 12. You can write that down. Read this this afternoon. Another time when Jesus did something horrible and he healed on the Sabbath. This time the guy's hand is like all withered up. And, and Jesus healed him. Restored him. And the Pharisees get so ticked off. Guess what they did? They went outside the synagogue and they plotted about how they could kill Jesus. Think about the irony of that. You cannot heal on the Sabbath, but you can plot a murder? Welcome to the church world, my friends. God help us live different. Calling you more. I'm convinced that the closer we get to the heart, the true heart of Jesus, the more offensive it is to the overly critical, judgmental church folks out there. Does it always have to be painful like this to do ministry? Probably. Unfortunately, to engage a society today who is ambivalent, not paying attention to Jesus at all, we must go where they are, which is everywhere, speak their language all the time. Jesus said to get into this world intentionally, without hesitation, without reservation, without removing the love, without watering it down one bit, we must confront the hard issues head on and know when the controversy comes, so be it. So, are you ready to be a disciple? Really? And have you started to count the cost? Because it will cost you something. You can be the sanitized, kind of North American version of a cultural Christian and blend right in. But if you genuinely begin to follow Jesus, it's going to cost you something, and it's going to continue to cost you something. You are going to be different. Kind Father, I pray that you would continue to make us different. Help us to search and ask ourselves, who is it that's welcome in this church? Who is it that we would go out of our way to make feel welcome here? The question becomes painful as we have to consider all of our prejudices, all of our insecurities, all of the things that we have become used to over time. God, we ask that you would strip those things from us, that you would continue to make us disciples, growing in closeness, growing in holiness, and that Holiness isn't about who we can shun, but who we can welcome. May the love of Christ indwell us, empower us, move through us, that we might be able to make a difference in the world around us. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would take these things and you would help us to see them as your things. Help me to see as you see so that I can do as you say, because as I try to do as you say, without seeing as you see, I argue, and I'm confused. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would work in me, through me, and in my friends who are here today, and through them as well, that the love of Jesus would shine forth from these people, from your church, everywhere. Everyone. All the time. Thanks. In Jesus' name.
Amen.